Not too many spaces there. Oh, but there are. <laughs> Hi everyone. This is my in-depth look at Empty Spaces from The Wall album. And it's significant that this song is linked, musically linked, both beginning and end, to that which comes before and after it. We could even say that it's not really a song in itself, more of a transition, even a non-entity, which is kind of a cool idea to play around with in this idea of empty spaces. And it wouldn't be musically wrong to treat it as so transitory in nature as to be undeserving of its own episode in this series. But I have chosen to give it full attention on its own. Perhaps it's my bias as a musician. I am reminded of the famous quote, often attributed to Debussy, that it is the spaces between the notes that make the music. You can recognize this in any performing art. It could be music, it could be dance, or let's say, take figure skating, for example. What is so impressive about a series of gravity-defying jumps and spins? Well, sure, of course, it's a technical and athletic feat of accomplishment, but when you watch a skater who's given attention not only to the technical elements and the physical development in order to be able to achieve those athletic impossibilities, to a skater who has given attention to developing the transitions between those elements into a work of art themselves, then suddenly the whole performance rises to a higher level. And it's the same with music. Practically anyone can work out the technical elements of, say, rattling off a flashy string of notes at machine gun pace and laser precision. But the moment we take our attention off of the notes and begin to focus on what happens between them, how can we sculpt the transitions to enhance, no, even to become the music? Then we begin to get closer to a real work of art. And as a musician myself, I am acutely aware of this. And I can confidently say that this is the most challenging part of giving a meaningful, compelling musical interpretation to forget about the notes and give attention to what lies between them. And so it is here with empty spaces. Let's give this transitory space some close attention and see what it is that we can find within it that will enhance and even um, grow our sense of meaning of this work. This song seamlessly transitions from the accompaniment pattern of Goodbye Blue Sky into the drumbeat of Empty Spaces, which is not the same as what we heard in In the Flesh, but still the suggestion of a heartbeat is quite clear. But this time, it sounds like an adult heart rather than the muffled heartbeat of an unborn baby that we're catching maybe through a stethoscope. This time, it sounds like the constant thumping in our ears, as if our own heart is the only one in existence, ever present in our consciousness, as one wanders through the airport or train station or other empty space, a place of connection, travel, coming and going, and yet a place of utter loneliness and lack of anchor. A place which is meaningless unless one possesses within his or herself purpose and direction. An airport is a place which could and should be the means of transporting us up into the blue sky. To adventure, opportunity, fulfillment, and yet it is a place in which when you look up there is no sky at all. 
It's hollow, empty, a sort of no man's land. One can even exist there for years without any documents, without belonging anywhere to anyone, without even having a country to call one's own. And then we hear the haunting, lonely melody enter, which is actually a melodic motif we've heard multiple times already. The first time it appears very briefly in the intro to In the Flesh, a sort of first hint of what is to return again and again throughout the album. It's unestablished and hardly glanced at in that moment, but still it is there. It is also the same melody used in Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. But now in empty spaces, it is slowed way down. You might recognize this. Think of the children singing, we don't need no education. And so forth. But what happens here is now these same four notes, and it is only a four note motif. The same four notes in the same ascending, descending pattern. And those four notes, one, two, three, four, are repeated over and over again in this empty spaces, just like they were repeated many times in Another Brick in the Wall Part Two. But the character and the quality is so musically different. When there's a recurring theme like this in a large musical work that is where this, this theme is always associated with a particular person or idea or situation. We musicians call it a leitmotif. I don't know if that was Waters' conscious intent when creating this music. In fact, after explaining what he felt the song was about, in the 1979 BBC interview, he said, On this level, the story is extremely simplistic. I hope that on another level, there are less tangible, more effective things that come through. Now, this statement might sound surprising at first. Essentially, he's saying that he's not able to articulate what he feels exists at a deeper level in this song but he hopes that other people will be able to find it. That's sometimes the way it works with artistic creations. An artist is inspired. He, he knows that what he is producing encompasses a lot. He can feel that within himself as he's making his creation. He, he, he knows that his Creation is well bound together, well balanced, it has all the important elements, but he may very well not always be conscious of all that it is, or all that it can be. And so, of course, he hopes that others will be able to discover more of it, that it will speak to them in a way that goes far beyond the superficial level. I think this leitmotif is significant. It makes us recall certain ideas which have been previously introduced or highlighted in this work already, and it encourages us to connect them as we build our interpretation. For example, at this point in our progress through the album, this leitmotif has been emphasized most emphatically in Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2. 
You'll remember it as the tune when the kids sing, We Don't Need No Education. That entire song is built around this four-note melody. And you'll remember that I emphasized the non-developmental, even intellectually deadening effect, which that particular presentation of the music communicates when I did my in-depth to that song, which a good many of you disagreed with, and that's totally okay. Now here, in Empty Spaces, we have another song built from the exact same motif. It sounds very different, but the melody still exists and practically cries out, begs for us to notice that it is truly the same as Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. Which then begs the question, what is being suggested by this? I find that it helps us to regain our bearings at this point. After all, we've just been through two songs, Mother and Goodbye Blue Sky, which could easily send us down the path of relating to this music as being more biographical, more literal, more limited to the story of a particular individual. Those two songs have a tendency of making us focus on the character's life as it relates to him, rather than remembering to remain aware of the larger message of this work. But by recognizing this melodic motif, linking two songs which emphasize the greater message of the album, we are impelled to regroup, to kind of refocus our attention and not lose sight of the forest for all the trees. Getting more specific, the motivic connection of Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 with empty spaces suggests that there is a direct link between the mindset, the anarchy of the former, and the emptiness of the latter. And it's inevitable, because while the destructive, repressive actions and institutions that society imposed were evil, the manner of protest, of rebelling against that evil, was counterproductive. It could not free the oppressed. Rather, it ushered in more oppression, more despair, more loss of self, so that all that now remains is emptiness. Emptiness which must be filled somehow. We find that also in this music. These four notes, which are the essentially the sum total, there, there's one or two moments in the song where an extra note is thrown in. But this is the building material of the entire song. And it's interesting to notice how he sets it up instrumentally, musically, harmonically. If you listen to the music, you'll notice that there are no chords filling in between the notes. We either have a single note as we hear when it first enters before the voice comes in, but when it's first stated. Or when we start getting more instrumentation coming, it comes as octaves. There's no harmonic filler. We don't hear full chords. We don't even hear a fifth added, which is, I've learned, get, um, you guitarists call it a power chord, which would add some level of depth to it. Instead, we simply have the octave. And in fact, we have the octave quite far apart. There's this big gap in the music which is unfilled by any sort of harmony. And 
what this does is it leaves us, even in the music, feeling empty. There is an emptiness. And for me, it's interesting. I play piano and I play harp. I, I perform on both those instruments. And each instrument has its own sonic qualities. A piano octave, if you play a piano octave, it tends to sound fuller and pianists often will double the bass or the melody in octaves in order to give a little bit beefier sound. On the harp, it doesn't really work that way. I could play this octave like this. Okay, you hear a little bit more. Another octave. Another octave. You can even go up here. It gets louder, but it never gets fuller. So as a harpist, I notice this emptiness even more than if I were playing it on the piano. And it's kind of like that with the instrumentation and the voice that we hear in empty spaces. Now, of course, there are other sounds used in the background to create the end effect, but this is what the music itself, the notes themselves, are offering us in the scheme of this piece of music. And so we have in this music, this deep bass note, and then the voice further up, and this wide space, empty space between, which must be filled somehow. And in the context of this song, there is a need to protect oneself, as now all safety is gone, and the question is asked, how shall I complete the wall? How shall I fill these wide, gaping spaces? The movie version of the song expands on this idea a bit further, as the questions asked in that more extended version tell us more and more about how and why evil is perpetuated in this world. Because so many are so empty. So many are seeking to fill the empty spaces. And every effort to do so not only increases the isolation of the perpetrator, but inflicts further damage on the rest of the world as well. Now, lyrically, the entire song is nothing but questions. But before tackling the questions, we have to ask, who is the we? Because remember, even the musical material itself is reminding us that in this album, pink is not only representing waters, nor some other individual, but many of us, all of us, even modern society as a whole. The animation in the movie also communicates this concept, beginning with the horrific story of his relationship with his wife, how it started in innocence until the white doves flew away, leaving room for the savage beasts, and then switching to the second part in which the concept is applied to our entire modern world. And because of that, we ought to look at this question from at least those two perspectives. In the first, we're looking at pink. Empty Spaces sits in the transition phase of pink's life. After all of side A, but before young lust. And in this respect, Goodbye Blue Sky and Empty Spaces are a pair, a team. The first is looking back and summing up what came before. While the second, this empty spaces, is setting the stage for the next part of the story. So we could interpret this song then as referring to the emptiness felt by Pink after he waves goodbye to the blue sky, which he thought was real. This is the emptiness which pushes him to find an alternative. And this is what we see in the coming track, Young Lust. In this case, the we, could be Pink and his mother, with whom 
He can no longer communicate since he now relates to her as nothing but another brick in the wall. Another option comes from remembering that we reach the present tense of the wall narration only in Hey You, which is still a little ways down the road. Therefore, empty spaces can represent a moment of reflection, a moment in which he's asking, how should I fill the final places? How should I complete the wall? Before, is there anybody out there? At which point the wall is completed and Pink is utterly isolated from the rest of the world. In this case, the we is Pink and his wife. Which makes a lot of sense, really, if we are taking into account the various telephone moments that we've noticed so far, as well as remembering that the communication block is his wife's accusation towards him during the trial. When she says, you should have talked to me more often than you did, but no, you had to go your own way, right? So what was his own way? It was building the wall. When it comes to Pink's person and story, I tend more towards the second scenario as the best fit in the entire narration. The two questions in the lyrics are what and how to complete his ultimate goal, finishing the wall. It's communication and connection where we used to talk versus isolation, the wall. Pink's main problem here is what should he use to finish isolating himself? Communication has already been cut. We used to talk. But this now has left some empty spaces in the wall. And it's fascinating to notice how this wall manifests itself in so many different ways throughout the album. Sometimes we are made to visualize it as surrounding a person, cutting them off from everything all around. Other times we understand that it is between two people. And now here we understand that it is within an individual. In this case, the wall is not outside of him, but within him. Because these empty spaces are not outside of him, but within. These spaces are leaving him vulnerable. Because after all, what does one do with the time and space that used to be filled with connection and conversation? It must be filled with something. What material can be used that is not going to include emotional, personal connection? Well, we know what comes next after this song, but I'm not going to anticipate at this moment. Right now, I want to step back and look at the second perspective. The one that I believe the music references and asks us to treat as more important. The perspective of us. Indeed, as I have said before, Pink and his own personal story is not about him at all but is meant to speak to each of us and to all of us. And the we of this song becomes the we of us. The second part of the movie animation acknowledges this too. What shall we, you and I, use to fill the empty spaces? Pink wanted independence, but he doesn't know how to manage himself, his life, his freedom. It's like a slave who returns to work for his master after being set free, or someone who remains in an abusive situation even when given the means to escape. And why? It's because they don't know how to live free. Their mind is not prepared for freedom. They don't know how to survive, let alone succeed, thrive, without another authority managing their lives. And here we have Pink, crippled in childhood by society, by school, by his mother and caregivers. And as a result, he does not have the capacity to live in freedom. He does not know what to do with his freedom. He is a faceless, masked young man without any personality. And as a result, 
Just like Water said in that BBC interview, he, or rather we, are becoming obsessed with other people's ideas, adopting somebody else's criteria for ourselves without considering them from a position of really being one's own self. Perhaps we throw off the shackles, destroy our destroyers, as in Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. But then we are afraid of the space that freedom brings. This is why the anarchical approach witnessed in Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 cannot improve matters at all. It leaves a wide, gaping space, and those who promote that solution have no replacement for what was destroyed. We take away all authority, destroy the system, tear everything apart, but then, very often with each of us, when we find nothing surrounding us to offer security, and we cannot conceive of life without security, much less a life in which we are responsible for our own way, in which we own ourselves, our choices, our actions, never passing the blame to someone else. We build a wall to hide behind, out of whatever material we can lay our hands upon, and we exert all our energy. We spend all our resources filling the empty spaces, but never becoming our selves, our own self. We essentially return ourselves to the bondage that we so desperately fought to escape. And, as evidenced in the movie, the world suffers because of us. Shall we buy a new guitar? Shall we drive a more powerful car? Shall we work straight through the night? Shall we get into fights? And the questions go on and on. But all of this, and all this time, with our backs to the wall. The animation in the movie is incredibly symbolically rich, especially for this song, and I feel that I could do an entire series exploring every little detail in, in it. But at this point in time, summing it up, we are in a sad, painful phase in the narration. Pink remains convinced that the wall is the way to safety. But it's okay. He will change his mind. I'll see you soon. Oh, but before I go, I want to say that I read about the secret message at the beginning of the song and the different interpretations of it, but the reason I decided to not get into that was because of Nick Mason's comment about it during an interview. He explained that the reason they decided to insert it there was because, back then, people were looking for these kinds of messages in music recordings. So they decided to throw one in. But when he was asked whether the message has any deeper meaning, he responded with a chuckle, it's complete nonsense. Well, I enjoy the fact that Pink Floyd were not so darkly serious as to be void of humor even, even in an album like this one. I'll see you next time. Should we include a secret message in one of the virgin rock videos <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't we inadvertently do that once already when remember when the sound cut off on one of our videos <laughs> i wonder if anybody decoded what i was saying there <laughs> <laughs>